In my final talk, I begin by looking at the way you use statistics to analyze data from nutritional studies. And I introduce the work of Bradford Hill, who in 1937 published the statistical manner in which you analyze large-scale data from population studies. And I show that they have been forgotten and distorted and that much of the research that's done in nutrition today uses such poor statistical methods that it becomes scaremongering because you can prove anything cause, causes anything. And the reality is when you go back to Bradford Hill's criteria, there is very little evidence for linking particular foodstuffs with chronic ill health. And certainly this idea that we've proven that cereals and grains make you healthy and fat makes you unhealthy is simply not sustained when you use the Bradford Hill criteria. And so it's very simple to explain why Tim Noakes can believe one thing and other experts can believe something else. If they ignore Bradford Hill, then you can say anything causes anything. But the reality is we need to look at the proper statistical methods in these analyses. The second point I'll talk about is insulin resistance and the fact that if you are insulin resistant, you need to avoid carbohydrates and why. And the third point is to see if we introduce cereals and grains into everyone, what are the long-term health consequences? And I will present the work of Dr. Alessio Fasano from Harvard, who believes that no human can digest gluten from wheat and rye and barley and that it's his opinion that we should cut those three foodstuffs out of our food chain. And I present the evidence because if he's right, then in 1977 when we told people to start eating lots of cereals and grains, we gave them exactly the wrong advice. I, I'm going to take a little bit of a risk in, in the way I present this talk initially, as you'll see. But I'm going to go through a couple of topics and I'm going to talk about the science of causation, which we haven't really discussed. Because when you go and look at the science of causation, you'll see where the problems arise. And I'm going to say that people think I'm wrong. And when I spoke about the diet the other day, or sorry, the carbohydrate loading story, I said I'm wrong. Absolutely. Now I'm going to tell you where I was right and, and why those people who have criticized me for being wrong are wrong. And I'm going to show you that because I'm going to discuss the science of causation and that that is the crucial factor in this whole debate and no one has really discussed it. And then I'm going to talk about understanding insulin resistance very briefly because that's the key. That's why we are right is because there is this condition insulin resistance. And then I'm going to talk about the grains and that's the next sugar. If you talk about tobacco sugar, grains are the next sugar and we haven't realized that. And then I'm going to finish up by taking the message to the world. And one of the reasons why I mentioned my wife, because she said, why can't you be more like Andreas? <laughs> you get so irritated and angry with people, but Andreas just floats along like this. <laughs> so, so I'm trying to be Andreas now. <laughs> so, now, looking at the science of causation, all of you know, and I've never defended myself in front of the Cape Town people as I have now, and I'm going to show you because, you know, I've been criticized by many people, and either they write and I'm wrong, or they're wrong and I'm right. And I've never defended myself, and I'm going to perhaps show you why I think I was right. So, so let's go to the science of causation. In the audience is Chris Bateman, and a few, two years ago, he, he wrote this article, which was a response that I had a debate with some people, and they came out and said some quite tough things about me. And I'm not gonna go through all of them because you can read them. He's way outside of his field and comfort zone. He doesn't understand the science and the whole concept. He's cherry picked, etc., etc., etc. blah, blah, blah. You'd expect better of Tim. He's a good reputation. He's extremely dangerous. He's been afforded the public space to propound these ideas without scientific validity, important. And what's scary is he's damaging patients and the population by insisting on this diet for life, etc. My overwhelming emotion is sadness that a person of his stature has made this mistake. And, and so it went on. And uh, if you don't deal with academic data, a person with public standing can do a tremendous amount of harm. Now, now so what they're saying, and these are honest, genuine people who spent their lives trying to help people. They're not, they're not ugly, horrible people, but they're saying out of a deep sense of conviction 
that what I'm doing and what we're doing is completely wrong and it's harming patients. Whereas we take the position that they're doing it, that they're harming people. So that's the, that's the paradox that we have to face. You, you go to the public when you have irrefutable evidence that this is the right thing to do. So the person who said that believes that there's irrefutable evidence that what we've been taught for the last 40 years is absolutely correct. And I think most of you now, having been here for four, three or four days, will perhaps question that. And Noakes' the theory is potential to divert people from diets and treatments that were known to do good and so on. But he's in the scientific world and his theories have no standing. So that was the position. And it actually didn't get any better, it got worse. <laughs> because a, a few months ago, um, this guy <laughs> is Noakes running a Ponzi scheme. And uh, so Magnus Haystack, who's a well-known financial expert, I've many times over the past 30 years experienced firsthand the birth, growth, and eventual demise of collective delusions, be it in investments, religion, or diets. The world is full of examples of Ponzi schemes. Religious fanaticism, as well as we are now once again witness to another example of collective delusion. The Banting diet, popularized once again by Dr. Tim Noakes and his fellow LCHF priests. So, so there you are, so that what we're teaching is a religion, it has no scientific basis. Well, we, I had a chat to Magnus, and he said, well, he's going to try the Banting diet. So, <laughs> <laughs> now, now, the next one is of interest because in the history of the University of Cape Town, no senior academic has never been criticized publicly in the space as I was a few months ago. And a few months ago, uh, this appeared in the Cape Times with a letter that this letter on the right was sent to the dean of every medical school in, the in South Africa, received a copy of this article, Noakes' Diet and Health Implications. And it came from the Faculty of Health Sciences. So this is my boss and a couple of his friends who sent this out. And it's interesting what they said. There's, there's good reason for concern that the diet may rather result in nutritional deficiencies Increased risk of heart disease, diabetes, kidney problems, constipation, certain cancers, and excessive iron stores in some individuals in the long term. Research leaves no doubt that healthy, balanced eating is very important in reducing disease risk. And then, then, then I was accused of making outrageous, unproven claims about disease prevention and maligning the integrity and credibility of peers who criticized his diet for being evidence deficient and not conforming to the tenets of good and responsible science. This goes against the University of Cape Town's commitment to academic freedom as a prerequisite to fostering responsible and respectful intellectual debate and free inquiry, which I think we have done at this conference. And then they finish up by saying this. The UCD's Faculty of Health Sciences, a leading research institute in Africa, has a reputation for research excellence to uphold. Above all, our research must be socially responsible. We have therefore taken the unusual step of distancing ourselves from the proponents of this diet. So, so that's, that's quite a statement for a senior academic at the university who has recently retired, just by the way. And, and the question is, well, who's right? You know, am I right or are they right? That we can't both be right, one of us is badly wrong. And so I'm gonna show you why I think that, that I was right and that they were wrong. And to do that, you have to go back to this guy, Sir Austin Bradford Hill, because he is the man who decided the cause, how you determine causation. And he developed principles of assessing causation. He said, essentially, there are a whole bunch of levels of valuable information. And as Zoe and others said, meta-analysis is considered very important, but so are randomized controlled prospective clinical trials. And the, the key question he faced was, if we don't do these trials, randomized controlled prospective clinical trials are considered the gold standard, but you can prove causation from cross-sectional studies, which are called associational studies, where we look at a population over time and we see what happens to them. You can prove causation if you fulfill certain criteria. Now, what I'm going to show you is that the US government and other people decided many years ago that it's much easier to fund these studies because they're less expensive than these studies which are very expensive. 
And so there was a shift from, so we kind of said, well, actually, as long as we do cross-sectional studies, we can come to the same conclusions. And that is true if you follow the Bradford Hill criteria. But if you break the Bradford Hill criteria, these studies cannot prove causation. And what I'm going to show you today is that we have dropped the bar. And we have said that as long as the simplest, the lowest level of performance is achieved in a cross-sectional study, we can forget about Bradford Hill and we can accept this as causation. The analogy would be in a rugby match. For one team, you say, well, actually, you guys must score when you cross the try line, but the other team must score when they go over, there, over the halfway line. That's a try. And that's exactly what happened. We dropped the bar so low that we, we, we came to the point where anything can cause anything. And that's what's really happened. So my argument is that those people who disagree with us are quoting data from scientific studies which the bar has been dropped so low that they can prove anything. And that is why when you pick up your newspaper tomorrow or the next day, there will be another study saying X causes Y, meat causes cancer or whatever. And the answer is it doesn't. But the bar is so low that the scientists got away with it. And the scientists are interested in publishing work and getting more funding and doing the same research. They're not necessarily interested in making you healthier. So that's the argument that I'm going to try to address. But, and we always say that anecdotes are of no importance. And so you've heard a lot of anecdotes today. And I'm going to give you a few more, but I'm going to show you why anecdotes are important. Dr. J. Wartman spoke about his experiences reversing type 2 diabetes. And is that important or not? So this was his story, which he gave us. And he said he reversed his type 2 diabetes. Now, is that an anecdote or is it more important than an anecdote? And the answer is very simple. And here I'm going to give you some more. Billy Tosh from Cape Town. Brian Berkman, who's in the audience, and I may well ask to come down if he would like to start walking down. And they both had type 2 diabetes and hypertension. And then Gerrit Skunby, who's going to come up right from the front here. And Gerrit Skunby, that was his position a few months before he learnt about this diet. And he, he, he went to his wife and said, I'm going to be dead in five years' time. You better make alternate arrangements. Well, five years later, he's here. <laughs> Thank you. So, so the next point is, this is what they look like today. Yeah. And they're all cured. No more type 2 diabetes. No more hypertension. I'm, you're welcome to say anything or just nothing. Just, just come to the, to the mic, Brian. Thank and Brian, Brian didn't, went, was, almost had bariatric surgery, but ultimately refused it. And as Andreas said, look at him now. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm really filled with a sense of, of gratitude to people like Prof Noakes and others who have persisted in promoting an alternative. Because for more than 20 years, uh, I struggled with tremendous obesity and no alternative was found for me. You know, I was going to go have the bariatric surgery feeling that that really was the only option that might work for me. And I'm just really incredibly grateful that he has risked so much and that this group has come together in support of this idea that there is another way, that you don't have to follow the conventional wisdom. So thank you very much for that. Thank you. If I tell my story, I'll be here the whole evening, so I won't <laughs> keep you. But all I can say, it was worth it. And mo more rewarding was to see patients' lives changed after giving them the same advice. And to see how people can go from 90 units or 130 units of insulin to no units of insulin, type 2 diabetics, in a time of four months. How people could lose 60 kilograms, how people could lose 50 kilograms, 
unbelievable stories that I could tell you. But all, I'm grateful for, for what happened in my life. It was so close and I didn't make it because I watched uh, Carte Blanche one night and I just saw the end of Prof's uh, story on Carte Blanche. And, and all I could hear was he said, I cut out carbs. And I said to my wife, I have to try this. If it wasn't for that night, I, I believed it was a, a turning point in my life. And yeah, all I can say is three years now and it's still getting better. Um, thank you, Prof, for what you're doing. And all I want to say for the people here, let's go with the re revolution. <laughs> So, so the question is, are these anecdotes which are meaningless in the broader scale, scale of things? And the answer is probably not for the following reason. And I got this from Richard Feynman, and in fact, a lot of this uh, story comes from Richard Feynman's ideas, and he's just produced this book because he's been promoting low carbs for a long time. And his book is The, the World Turned Upside Down, The Second Low Carb Revolution. And he says the second one will when people realize that cancer, as Gary showed us, is strongly linked to carbohydrate ingestion and other things, but carbohydrates are important. And he says when people realize that, that'll be the second revolution. But he asked the question, how many subjects do you require in a trial to prove an effect? And the simple answer is it depends on how many people recover spontaneously. Because if you have a lot of people recovering spontaneously, you need a big study. But as far as I know, if there's never been a reported reversal of type 2 diabetes in patients following a conventional medical advice, then a single case is not an anecdote. Yeah, yeah. It becomes a black swan. Yeah. And that's, that's the truth. And you know the story of the black swan? All swans were white because the British described them. But in Australia being different, we had black swans. So eventually someone went to Australia, saw a black swan and said, this can't be a swan because it's black. And then they had to decide, is it a swan? And they did all the genetic testing and everything and decided, yes, it is a swan. So they had to change the definition. And so that's the same here. These are not anecdotes. They actually address major questions in the way we manage type 2 diabetes. The presence of a black swan requires, and I believe this, and when I wrote an article on 127 people who had written to me, including Kerat and Brian, and published in the South African Medical I was criticized. And all I asked for was a randomized controlled clinical trial. That's all I asked for. The presence of a black swan requires the immediate funding of a proper scientific study, a randomized controlled clinical trial to test whether it is possible to reverse type 2 diabetes with a low carbohydrate diet. And that is one of the major priorities of the Noakes Foundation is to fund such a study to see if we can reverse type 2 diabetes in recently diagnosed patients with type 2 diabetes using the techniques that we've learned from these experts. And Anecdotes, this book, Waterlogged, where I took on the industry, I took on Pepsi-Cola, that started with a single anecdote, a lady who collapsed in a marathon race, and she was not dehydrated, she was overhydrated, and that was an anecdote, and it led to 30 years research, and changed the whole understanding of how we drink during exercise. So let's now move down to randomized controlled prospective clinical trials, which are considered the gold standard. And let's look, and we have discussed some of these, they have been discussed at length. And the one great study was the Women's Health Initiative. As was said, this was the, the moonshot to try to prove that a low-fat diet can improve one's health and prevent heart disease and cancer. And this is how you do a randomized control. You take a large number of women, or men, obviously, and you assign one group to a low-fat eating pattern and the other to a self-selected dietary behavior, which you actually don't check up on, which, which is perhaps a little bit of a problem. And this group was told to reduce their energy from fat to 20%, saturated fat to 7%, increase fruit and veg intake to at least five servings per day. I wonder where that came from. And so on. And the other group were handed a copy of the dietary guidelines for Americans and told a foot sack and get on with it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so this is a very biased study because this group is benefiting because they actually saw the researchers once a month or so. That, then they were followed for 8.1 years. And the outcome was the following study did not significantly reduce the risk of coronary heart disease, stroke, or cardiovascular disease in postmenopausal women, and achieved only modest effects on cardiovascular risk factors. And it's not the only one. There are two other major studies costing billions of dollars, which have really proven that the low-fat diet didn't work. But how did the people respond who ran the trial? And particularly the funders, the National Institute of Health. This is the lady who was heading up the National Institute of Health at the time, 
And, and so obviously the pressure is on her to produce outcomes. And this is what she said, the results of the study do not change established recommendations on disease prevention. Women should continue to work with their doctors to reduce their risk for heart disease, including following a diet low in saturated trans fats and cholesterol. Now that's, that's an ad hoc change in the protocol or in the interpretation. Because if you're dealing proper research, there's a null hypothesis. And if your study disproves that hypothesis, then the hypothesis is null. It's void. You can't change it. So actually, no, Dr. Nabel, the study disproved your hypothesis. So grow up and accept it. <laughs> in real science, when the, the hypothesis is disproven, we have to come up with a new one and attempt to disprove it. Science does not prove hypotheses, it just disproves them. So the, the solution is what she should have said was, we got it wrong. Instead, they might as well have not done the trial because she used the same recommendations before the trial and after the trial. So what did the trial do? It made no effect. And that's not science. And this is what the famous Upton Sinclair theorem, it's difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on his not understanding it. <laughs> so, so. You know, I don't know if her salary depended on it, but, but anyway, that was the story. And to understand science, you have to understand what, what Stephen Hawking, who really understands science because he's an astrophysicist, and astrophysicists change their mind every week. There's a new theory of the universe, and they don't mind change. But in medicine, we don't like change. The theory always comes first. The theory then makes predictions which can be tested by observation. If the observations agree with predictions, that doesn't prove the theory, but the theory survives to make further predictions which are tested against observation. And he continues, but people are very reluctant to give up a theory in which they've invested a lot of time. And that's the reality. And that's why it took me so long to change my ideas about the high carbohydrate diet, because I'd invested 30 years research in it. They usually start by questioning the accuracy of their observations. If that fails, they try to modify the theory in an ad hoc manner. Eventually, the theory becomes a creaking and, ug creaking and ugly edifice. And that's what we've exposed over the last four days. We've exposed the creaking and ugly edifice of this nutrition advice. Anyone who's been here for those four days says, but it can't be true. There's so much evidence against it. And he said, then someone suggests a new theory in which all the awkward observations are explained in an elegant and natural way. And, and that's, in a sense, what we've done. We've shown that there's an elegant explanation for what the problems. And, of course, there's an elegant solution as well. And so what science is really all about is you develop a hypothesis and then you design a method to test it. So you do an experiment to try to refute it, not to prove it, to refute it. And then you modify your hypothesis because you learned something from that experiment and you do another experiment and you refute that and then you remodify your hypothesis. And this goes on and on and on and on. And you never reach that point. You never reach the point of truth because you never know that you did the final experiment. You don't have the equipment or the knowledge to be certain that you did the final experiment to refute the hypothesis so that you finally came up with the true one. And that's, we have to reality, that's a reality. So, so biological mechanisms, or perhaps all scientific theories, are never proven. By analogy with the court of law, you cannot be found insolent, sorry, innocent only, not guilty. That's very important. So when people say that Tim Noakes is absolutely wrong, and we're absolutely right, they don't understand science. Because you can't come and say that you're absolutely right and everyone else is absolutely wrong. And the greatest mind that we've had in the last century said exactly that. No amount of experimentation can ever prove me right. A single experiment may at any time prove me wrong. But now that leads to the problem which I see that everyone wants that final study that's gonna prove the high fat diet or the high carbohydrate diet. And there's never gonna be that final experiment. You have to look at the totality of the evidence and it must all be coherent. That's another word, coherence. And if there's evidence that's not coherent with your theory, it suggests you should be throwing the theory out. So here are two other studies which are also long-term RCTs, which also fail to show any benefit of a low-fat diet. So we have three major studies, and this one was in type 2 diabetes, and they had to terminate it because it produced no result. Now, in this study, there was an interesting thing, an interesting part of this study, the Women's Health Initiative, was hidden somewhere in here, 
was some data which I was very critical about and perhaps I shouldn't have been so critical because what came out in that study was the following statement and I introduced this to show you what these words mean and it said the HR is the hazard ratio of those women with heart disease at the start of the trial was 1.26. What that means was that their risk of having a heart attack during the trial if they changed their diet to a low fat diet went up 26%. Okay? So theoretically, this study, the Women's Health Initiative, actually disproves the whole hypothesis. Not only does it not support it, it disproves it because the people who are at the greatest risk, the people, women with heart disease, their risk rises by 26%. But the question is, does that 26% mean anything? And that's what I'm going to address. Because I don't think it does. But at the time I wrote a critique of this article, I did think it did. So that's, that's the bar, the level of the bar. So, however, it's entirely predictable that a high carbohydrate diet produces a specific atheroma generating metabolic profile in those who are metabolically vulnerable because they have insulin resistance. So the theory that going on to a low-fat diet and having more heart disease is entirely predictable on this basis. And I'll show you a study. Remember, we spoke about coherence. Everything must be coherent. And if you have one study that completely contradicts everything you say, you have to be very careful about it. And there is one study in the literature which really is most interesting because this is a study by Darius Mozaferian, who is slowly, slowly inching towards the low-carbohydrate low diet. He's inching there. So they did this study where they had women, postmenopausal women, who were put on estrogen, and they had two coronary angiograms, which means that the coronary arteries were studied in detail two times, I think it was about three years apart, because they wanted to see could estrogen slow down the progression of coronary artery disease. And it is not a randomized controlled trial, but it does have some interesting information because people had been eating the same diet all their lives, you would expect. They're not suddenly going to change their diets. And they asked the question, what dietary factor predicted progression of coronary artery disease during that three-year period? And all of you know what it has to be, saturated fat, obviously. So let's see what they actually found. So here they go. And so these are the quartiles of patients by nutrient intake. And this is the progression of the disease. So if the value is down here, it means there's a lot of progression. If the value is up here, it means there's little progression on the same side here. So this group shows lots of progression and that group shows lots of progression. Now this is cool. So this is the group that eats the least of these and that's the group that eats the most. So what you observe is saturated fat in gold. This group here, eating the least saturated fat, have the most progression. This group eating the most saturated fat have the least progression. So if we put that arrow, this is the arrow of increasing saturated fat consumption by this group. The more saturated fat they ate, the less arterial progression. And this is measured in these people over three years. And the next one was that the more polyunsaturated fat they ate, this group is eating little, that group is eating a lot, the more the disease progressed. And what about carbohydrates? Exactly the same. The more carbohydrates, the more progression. So this is the only clinical associational study of which I'm aware, in which dietary changes, or dietary patterns or practices are studied over three years and their effects on the coronary arteries are studied. And what does it show? It shows the exact opposite to what we've been told. So this study is buried and no one ever record, talks about it. This was their conclusion. In postmenopausal women with relatively low total fat intake, a greater saturated fat intake is associated with a less progression of coronary atherosclerosis, whereas carbohydrate intake is associated with a greater progression. And the other study, that also from this, the Women's Health Initiative, they found that diabetics did rather badly on the diet as well. And they only ever reported the one-year data. As far as I know, they still haven't reported eight-year data because the one-year data were not looking good. And women with diabetes at baseline did experience adverse glycemic effects of the low-fat diet, which indicated that caution should be exercised in recommending a reduction in overall dietary fat in women with diabetes unless accompanied by additional recommendations to... And, you know, this is the choice of words. 
to, to guide carbohydrate intake. Well, what they've said is the women did badly if they ate more carbohydrates. So what would you say? I mean, there's only one thing, to restrict. That, that's what you have to put in there. But why didn't they have the courage to put it in there when they look at the data? So fortunately, things have changed. In the last week or so, this was published by the leaders in the field from the Jocelyn Clinic. And the medical director, Dr. Hambry, has published this for the first time. And what does he conclude? It's clear that we made a major mistake in recommending the increase of carbohydrate load to greater than 40% of the total caloric intake. This era should come to an end if we seriously want, seriously want to reduce the obesity and diabetes epidemics. Such a move may also improve diabetes control and reduce the risk for cardiovascular disease. Unfortunately, many physicians and dietitians across the nation are still recommending high carbohydrate diets for patients with diabetes, a recommendation that may harm their patients more than benefit them. So that is now the most recent statement from the Jocelyn Clinic considered the Centers for, for Diabetes Research. So let's go back now and try to understand this, what does this 1.26 mean? And does it mean anything? And for that, was the Women's Health Initiative correct to ignore that 26% 26 in, increased risk of heart disease in postmenopausal women? What does that 26% really mean? So we go back and we look at Austin Bradford Hill, because he's the father of medical statistics. And he's kind of been forgotten. And he's famous because he did the first randomized control clinical trial. He designed it. And it was the use of streptomycin in the treatment of pulmonary tuberculosis. And he worked out exactly how you did a randomized trial. And they showed that streptomycin works, and that was a major change. And they also showed, because they did it so carefully, that the patients developed resistance. And if they hadn't done the study properly, they would never have got that. And his next one was looking at smoking and cancer of the lung with Dr. Dole. This is the book that he wrote. He wrote a textbook uh, on the basis of those lectures. So he did the first randomized controlled clinical trial. He proved so that smoking causes lung cancer, but initially from an associational study, which cannot prove causation, but it can if you follow his rules. And then he wrote a series of articles in The Lancet describing the use of t statistics in medical science. So he's a really important person. And he said that when you assess, you want to find out whether something's associated or causal of a particular disease, you have to look at these nine factors. And we won't go through all of them. I'm just going to focus on coherence, which is that everything lines up. All the evidence is the same. And so that's the one, the coherence and the strength of the relationship. I, to me, those are the two really important factors. There must be a strong, a strong relationship and secondly, it must be coherent and make sense. He said, how then are nine different viewpoints from all of which we should study association before we can cry causation? You don't just cry causation, you have to prove it. What I do not believe is that we can usefully lay down some hard and fast rules of evidence that must be obeyed before we accept cause and effect. None of my nine viewpoints can bring indisputable evidence for or against the cause and effect hypothesis, and none can be required as a sine qua non. What they can do with greater or lesser strength is to help us make up our minds on the fundamental question. Is there any other way of explaining the set of facts before us? Is there ever any other answer equally or more likely than cause and effect? So that was his guideline statement. And when he looked for coherence, and that's what people have been speaking about, the problem with the cholesterol heart disease theory is it's not coherent because there's so much contrary evidence. And I, I could go all day and list many more. But deaths from heart disease in the U.S. has been falling since at least 1968, and all the prevention things started after that. Fat intake has not changed in the U.S. over 100 years, and that tells us fat's got nothing to do with heart disease. That's coherence. If it hasn't changed and the heart disease has gone up and down, it can't be related. It doesn't matter what anyone says and whatever studies they do, that's lack of coherence. We didn't need the Women's Health Initiative because of that fact. No evidence that humans who develop heart disease eat more fat than those without heart disease. In fact, it gets forgotten. There's no known metabolic pathway by which increased saturated fat in the diet raises blood LDL cholesterol concentrations and clogs the arteries. So there's not even a mechanism for it. There's no evidence from population studies that those with higher LDL cholesterol values eat more fat. No evidence from at least three major randomized controlled trials that reducing fat in the diet improves outcomes. So simply on the basis of coherence, you know that the story can't be true, even though it obviously has been disproven. So if we go back to those, those are the points of coherence, here's just to show you. 
This is what's happened in, in food intake. People say meat's the cause of all the problems. In, in, well, meat consumption has gone down dramatically since 1975 in the United States. White chicken has risen, but otherwise everything's pretty stable, but beef and pork have gone down a bit. So anyone tells you that meat's the cause of all the problems in the last 20 years, it's just not coherent. You shouldn't even begin to start the study. So James Lanoue said, bear in mind that Sir Austin Bradford Hill insists that statistical infer inferences by themselves have no meaning unless they are internally coherent. That was his point. That is to say, when several different types of evidence for an association between environmental factor and disease are examined, they must all point to the same conclusion. Take, put another way, no matter how plausible the link between dietary fat and heart disease might seem, just one substantial inconsistency in the statistical evidence effectively undermines it. Just one thing, and I've shown you plenty of evidence against that. So now let's look at the hazard ratios, because that's the value. The hazard ratio, and remember we were talking about a value of 1.26 down here. So you can see I've got quite a wide scale. So now the first study to look at association as a possible cause of causation, that's the, sorry, that's the decreasing evidence, was this study in, of scrotal cancer in chimney sweeps. And it was published in 1875 by Percival Pott. And he showed that if you were a chimney sweep, you had a 2,000-fold increased risk of developing scrotal cancer. Now, most of us would say, well, that's pretty powerful evidence. <laughs> And the answer is because scrotal cancer doesn't exist outside of those people. So that is, no one would argue that that is cause and effect, without even knowing how the tars that got into their underpants caused the cancer. Dahl, in an associational study, found that heavy smokers had a 20 to 30 fold increase, i.e. the hazard ratio was 20 or 30 in heavy smokers. And that was good enough for him to say, yes, uh, smoking causes lung cancer. This was a study from John Snow in 1849 when he showed that people who got their water from the Southwark and Vauxhall Company in London were at a 14-fold increased risk of developing cholera. And so that was also accepted as scientific evidence, proof. However, of course, he got criticism. Dr. Snow's view on cholera generally regarded in the profession as very unsound. <laughs> But he was right, without knowing what caused the problem. Lung cancer in all smokes is tenfold increased risk. So we've gone from 2000 to 10, and now we finish up at 2, and that's death from coronary thrombosis in smokers. Now the question is, well, how valuable is this? If we accept that these are strong, what, how powerful is that? And Bradford Hill made a comment. He said, on the other hand, the death rates from coronary thrombosis in smokers is no more than twice, possibly less, the death rate in non-smokers. Though there is good evidence to support causation at a value of two, it is surely much easier in this case to think of some features of life that may go hand in hand with smoking, features that might conceivably be the real underlying cause or at least an important contributor, whether it be lack of exercise, nature, diet or other factors. So he's saying when the value gets to two, you can't assume that it's causation. You have to think there's something else that smokers do. And that's the key, because smokers will do things that are different. They won't, may not exercise. They may do all sorts of other things. But then he goes on to say, with cancer of the lung, it was so strong, you had to find another explanation for why it wasn't true. So remember, so the two, I interpret that to mean that Bradford Hill said, when the hazard ratio is below two, you're in an area where you can't say it's causation. And so this is the area now we're working in down here. No evidence for causation in an associational study. And I've called that the science of scaremongering. Or, or junk science, but the science of scaremongering. And so the question is, what science fits in here? And the answer is that all the associational nutritional studies that are used to justify the 1977 USDA Dietary Guidelines are based on studies with hazard ratios usually between 0.7, i.e. that's 0.3 down, or 1.3 above, which Bradford Hill would have said is meaningless, absolutely meaningless. Bradford Hill would not have accepted any of these studies as evidence for causation or to be used as a sole justification for novel global dietary guidelines. And that's my point, that we dropped the bar so low because he's no longer with us. If he was alive, 
he would jump on all the signs and say it's, it's wrong, but he's not alive. And so that, in my opinion, is what happened. But fortunately, we do have someone went and did a meta-analysis using four of the Bradford Hill criteria for nutritional studies. So even in his shadow, work has been done. And this was their conclusion, using four Bradford Hill criteria, strength, consistency, temporality, and coherence. They claimed there was strong evidence for protective effects against heart disease of vegetables, nuts, the Mediterranean diet, and high quality dietary patterns. I'm not quite sure what that means. But this is exactly what you've heard from us. Vegetables, nuts, the more Mediterranean diet, which is a higher fat diet. Harmful effects promoting heart disease, trans fatty acids, and foods with high glycemic index or load, high carbohydrate diets, and insufficient evidence for saturated and polyunsaturated fatty acids, total fat, alpha linolenic acid, meat, eggs, milk. So that's what, when people go and look and use the Bradford Hill criteria, they find that saturated fat, meat, eggs, and milk are innocent. But when that letter was written to the Cape Times, we were told that we were killing patients because we were advising this diet. So what did James Lafano said? Meanwhile, the simple expedient of closing down most university departments of epidemiology could both extinguish the endlessly fertile source of anxiety mongering while simultaneously releasing funds. So that was his view of what we had to do for that research. So I won't bore you. The evidence that fat isn't the factor, we've seen that slide before. Uh, we've seen Nina Teicholt, and may I say that Nina Teicholt is in this room in her, she's not in present, but in spirit she's here. We asked her to come, and she said, Tim, one hour before you invited me, I accepted an appointment to talk in America. She said, otherwise I would have been here. And I'm sure she'll be here the next time. And she wrote this, the advice that comes out of this book is that a higher fat diet is almost assuredly healthier than one low in fat and high in carbohydrates. The most rigorous science now supports this statement. And that is her, it's a fantastic book. Everyone has to read it. And then it was reviewed in the British Medical Journal by Richard Smith, and who, has, who was a former editor. And this is what he wrote. The title, the subtitle, and the cover of the book are all demeaning, but the forensic demolition of the hypothesis that saturated fat is the cause of cardiovascular disease is impressive. Indeed, the book is deeply disturbing in showing how overenthusiastic scientists, poor science, massive conflicts of interest, and politically driven policymakers can make deeply damaging mistakes. Over 40 years, I've come to recognize that I might, what I might have known from the beginning, that science is a human activity with the error, self-deception, grandiosity, bias, self-interest, cruelty, fraud, and theft that is inherent in all human activities, together with some saintliness, but this book shook me. It is a fantastic book, and that is, is quite a statement. And it's exactly what, what Asim Malotra was talking about, the influence, the political influence on what we're trying to do. And then, more recently this month, there's another paper showing that there's no association between dietary intake of saturated fatty acids and incidence of coronary events or mortality in patients with established coronary artery disease, a very large study just published. Again, you know, it all fits. Again, it's all coherent. And then we've had this fabulous study from Zoe, which was published last week, and that was one of her conclusions. Recommendations were made for 276 million people following secondary studies of 2467 ill males with reported identical all-cause mortality, i.e. there was no effect. RCT evidence did not support the introduction of dietary fat guidelines. So people really have to release this lipophobia, release that it, it's gone, it doesn't exist. There's no evidence for it. So this was, was Bradford Hill's final statement. All, all scientific work is incomplete, whether it be observational or experimental, all scientific work is liable to be upset or modified by advancing knowledge. That does not confer on, on, upon us a freedom to ignore the knowledge we already have or to postpone the action that it appears to be demanded at a given time. And to me, that's a call to arms because I think we have the evidence that we have to do something. We can't continue the way we have. So that's the first point. And so that was my answer, that we lay, ro lowered the bar so far that we started over-interpreting evidence that wasn't there, and that caused the problem. It's vitally important that at our medical schools we start to teach insulin resistance as the single most important medical condition across the globe. 
This is the disease we should be worried about. Not, well, of course we must be concerned about HIV and tuberculosis and all those other diseases, but this is the real problem. And I'm briefly going to go through it. And the answer, as, as we as a panel believe, and has been frequently spoken at this conference, is that these are not diseases per se, except perhaps this becomes a disease. They're conditions that are caused by an abnormal biological response to an abnormal input. And the abnormal input is the high carbohydrate diet. And we have to know where we sit on this curve. And we have to know where every patient we deal with sits on this curve. Are they carbohydrate tolerant or intolerant? And if they're tolerant, they're usually sensitive, insensitive to athletes, normal body weight. But down at this end, where many of us sit, this is the problem. If you continue to eat carbohydrates, that's what's going to happen. You're going to develop type 2 diabetes. It's very simple. There's one slide that shows you the whole mechanism, how it happens. That's insulin resistance. And the first problem, in my view, it's a genetic predisposition progressively worsens with age and a high carbohydrate diet. And Jason showed us evidence for that. As we get older and we eat high carbohydrate diets, we become more insulin resistant. The key abnormality is a liver that produces too much glucose. And the next feature is that we have a reduced capacity to store and use the carbohydrates as a fuel. And as a consequence, our blood glucose insulin levels are always high, particularly when we eat carbohydrates. And as many people have shown already, you have to convert that carbohydrate into fat in the liver and then to blood triglycerides. And a consequence is that lowers your HDL and it raises your small dense LDL cholesterol particles, which are considered toxic. And as a consequence of all that, you then develop this atherogenic dyslipidemia, which I'm going to come back to. But notice the evidence, the emphasis is not on cholesterol, it's on triglycerides, HDL, and small dense LDL particles. What's really interesting, I think, in the last year or two is that the key abnormality in type 2 diabetes is dysregulation of pancreatic glucagon production, not insulin. That's going to become really interesting. And the problem in treatment of diabetes is that we give insulin, and insulin can't correct that problem for reasons. And that's why Justin Fong gave this amazing lecture why insulin actually hurts the diabetic patient when it's given an excess in people who are eating carbohydrates, that you have to reduce your insulin requirements if you want to live a long time, whether you're healthy or with type 2 diabetes. And the father of this is Gerald Raven. It's not Tim Noakes. I didn't make this up. This guy came along. No one knew what insulin resistance was, and he saw it and developed it and developed the concept. And essentially, I'm going to go through this rather quickly, but what he showed I'm not, was that it's all related to insulin and the production of triglycerides in the liver. That's the key abnormality. And so this study shows the role of insulin in producing triglycerides in the bloodstream. And what he showed, and this was already in 1967, was that the triglyceride concentration in your blood is a direct measure of how much liver, your, how much triglyceride is produced in the liver. So, so if your triglycerides are up here, it's because your liver is pumping out triglycerides. Absolutely linear relationship, but what was driving it? It was insulin. So the more insulin, the more triglycerides were being produced. Now this is an astonishing study. I mean, this is Nobel Prize winning stuff to show that because this becomes then the basis for understanding insulin resistance. And he hit on it in, in 1967. And, and then he just said that insulin is the key driver. And he then comes up with this model of disease. And it's terribly important because this is not what's taught, as I'll show you. So, so what he said was that if you're insulin resistant and you eat carbohydrates, you always have a compensatory hyperinsulinemia, which causes the metabolic syndrome, which ultimately leads to coronary heart disease. If your pancreas fails, you, you secrete too little insulin. Or if you're secreting too much glucagon, you secrete your blood glucose, you'll become diabetic, and you'll go that way. And he said, these are the abnormalities that are caused by insulin. Notice the focus, this is insulin. And this is exactly what Jason spoke about two days ago. That it's the insulin that drives all these abnormalities. So these are the end point product, not of obesity, but of a high insulin 
Now, Raven should win the Nobel Prize, in my view, in, if, in due course, but he's not going to because I think he made one error. And you see, hyperinsulinemia isn't the problem. The problem is the high carbohydrate diet. Because without the high carbohydrate diet, you don't get compensatory hyperinsulinemia. And that was the weakness in his, his, his story. And in my view, a balanced diet must minimize insulin secretion all times as those with in, in those with insulin resistance. That is a balanced diet. So we talk about moderate diets and balanced. Well, if you're insulin resistant, that's the measure you want to look for. Now, Raven understood the role of carbohydrates because the basic defect in the metabolic syndrome is resistance to insulin-mediated glucose disposal. That's not quite true, but anyway, if dietary carbohydrate is increased in an isocaloric diet, additional insulin must be secreted to maintain glucose homeostasis. So how do you correct it? You cut the carbohydrates. But he never had the courage to say that. And I think that was because he was surrounded by lipophobes, lipophobic cardiologists who would have nailed him and said, have you gone mad to tell people to eat fat? So that was, I think, where, where he missed it, because he was at Stanford, and Stanford is a, is a great center for cardiology. So this is the insulinocentric model of chronic ill health. It's contrast with the fat and cholesterol model of, heart, of chronic disease. This is the insulin-centric model. So Raven understood that carbohydrates drive insulin secretion in the metabol metabolic syndrome insulin resistance, hence he had to conclude that restricting dietary carbohydrates should be the key therapy for this condition. But he's never ad advocated this form of therapy. Can he still win the Nobel Prize? Because he absolutely deserves it. But, but he didn't get the, the treatment right. Steve Finney and Jeff Volek did the most important study, in my view, of showing exactly how low carbohydrate diets affect all your metabolic profiles in blood. And I think this is a very important study because they, com they compared a high carbohydrate with a, with a low carbohydrate, high fat diet, 60% carbohydrate, 60% fat, in a group with metabolic syndrome. And what do they show? In yellow, they show that the group eating the high fat diet lose more weight, they lose more abdominal fat, their blood glucose goes down more, their insulin goes down more. And that's key, because this is a disease of insulin, so you want to get insulin down. And when insulin goes down, what happens to triglycerides? They go shooting down. So, and then that's the area under the curve in response to these various tests. And here's HDL cholesterol, which can be considered the good one, and it goes up on this diet, and it goes down on the high carbohydrate diet. And that's your HDL, triglyceride to HDL ratio, which is dramatically improved. And this is considered one of the best predictors of heart attack risk. And these are the small particles which we don't want and they increase on a high carbohydrate diet and they decrease on a high fat diet. And this, Steve mentioned this, that it's the saturated fatty acids in your bloodstream that are toxic. And notice that on this high fat diet, you reduce your production of saturated fats. And they've subsequently published a new paper earlier this year showing exactly the same, that the saturated fats in the blood come from carbohydrate, not from fat. And then APOB, which is another marker, and other markers. So this is an important study, and I just bring, draw your attention to it. If you want to know if your patients are sick or not, notice that the high fat diet changes everything in the same direction. All of the factors change in the same direction. So if we see cha change in one, we would expect change in many. So what do we do in South Africa? We tell people to eat lots of carbohydrates. So these are the dietary guidelines that were released in 2013, make starchy foods part of most meals. Food-based dietary guidelines for South Africa, make starchy foods the base of most meals, eat plenty of vegetables and fruits, remove the fat. Now, what is that a prescription for? It's a prescription for obesity in an insulin-resistant population. That's it. You couldn't make a better prescription for obesity if you're dealing with insulin-resistant people. So do we have any evidence in South Africa that we're dealing with an insulin-resistant population? Well, here's a study of poor people from Venda, and they're women. And let's look at their, their report. They were found to have a healthy diet, eating 20% fat, 70% carbohydrate, yet they have high rates of obesity, hypertension, and dyslipidemia. But which dyslipidemia is it? It's high blood triglycerides and low HDL. What does that mean? They are insulin-resistant. That's it. 
You can make the diagnosis. And they have high rates of diabetes, not reported in this study. So this population is insulin resistant. Their high carbohydrate diet is contraindicated. And does this apply to all obese rural female South Africans? Because if it does, we've got the solution. Insulin resistant, eating a high carbohydrate diet. Well, by chance, by absolute chance, a few weeks ago, I received this journal. And I receive it every, day, every month for the last two years. And because I've been working so hard, I haven't read it. I opened this edition, and I opened it on one page, and there was a study from South Africa, from Belleville, which is just a little far away from here, over the Lisbeck River, and it was called Baseline Characteristic of Participants, and uh, this is the data, grouped according to the quarters of gamma glutamyl transferase in the blood. Gamma glutamyl transferase is a marker of a fatty liver. As the liver becomes fatty, it releases more of these enzymes. So this is the group that is potentially the healthiest, and that is the group that's potentially the least healthy and should have the most fat in the liver. So this is their blood pressures. You notice they rise across the pattern. Their mean body fat index rises. Their mean waist circumference rises. Their mean fasting glucose. Okay, 5.9, 6.2. That's abnormal, that's abnormal, that's abnormal, that's abnormal. This population was not, so, was, they just were studied. They were a random population. They were not coming to the hospital because they were sick. Mean fasting insulin. Insulin rises across the board. He has HbA1c. And we normally say 5.5 below is fine. 6.1. This is the healthiest pop group. Their HbA1c is 6.1. And the worst is 6.4. This is essentially diabetes. This is a healthy population, so-called healthy population in Belleville. This is their mean triglycerides. They rise across the board. The mean HDL goes pretty much stays the same. Total cholesterol doesn't change much. So if you looked at the cholesterol, you might say it's a bit high, but it doesn't look too bad. And that's the inflammation. And this is the metabolic syndrome. 47% of the group, the healthiest group, were considered to have the metabolic syndrome. And 65% of the group were considered to have metabolic syndrome, the, the, the sickest group. So what does that tell us about the good people living in Belleville? They're not very healthy and there's a lot of insulin resistance. And this population is suffering from carbohydrate intoxication. That's what it is. Did the, did the experimenters or the researchers pick it up? I don't think they did. And what diet advice should they receive? And are they receiving that advice? And I think that's the evidence. It's really interesting that there was another paper behind this one from two colleagues who criticized me, who I referred to in the early parts of the lecture. And they found exactly the same in a group in Cape Town, except they didn't measure HbA1c and fasting insulin. They didn't measure HbA1c. And the question was, why not? Because it didn't fit their model. Because they're not looking for, for insulin resistance. Whereas this group clearly was looking for insulin resistance. So I think that's really good evidence that we are surrounded by a population that is full of insulin resistance and we need to do something about it. Okay, I'm gonna pick up very quickly, and this is only gonna take five minutes or so. What we don't emphasize is the role of gluten when we've promoted cereals and grains, we haven't asked what were the consequences of that. And I'm going to go very briefly through that, and you've seen a couple of these slides, that these are some of the questions that are being asked about grains. Do grains damage the brain? Do they make us fat? And is there any evidence that they're actually healthy? And in fact, there are some randomized controlled trials using cereals and grains, and they never show any benefit. So these are important, and this is an important study suggesting dementia might be linked to, to wheat. William Davis, who was perhaps the first brave guy to come out and say wheat perhaps isn't so great, he said the gliadin protein of wheat gluten present in all forms of wheat from spongy, spongy wonder bread to the coarsest organic multigrain loaf has the unique ability to make your intestine permeable. Recent research has fingered wheat gliadin as a trigger of intestinal release of zonulin, a regulator of intestinal permeability. And, and the, the hero, my hero, and this is another guy who deserves a Nobel Prize, I hope you'll get one in due course, Alessio Fasano, he discovered a novel mechanism by which wheat gluten gliadin causes the leaky gut syndrome, re leading to a range of autoimmune and other diseases. And it's a very complex slide, but essentially what he found was when you eat wheat and you produce gliadin, gliadin causes zonulin to be secreted in the gut. And zonulin blind, binds to receptors on the intestinal wall, and normally the cells are tightly fused together as soon as zonulin binds, the cells open up. And this means that potentially anything that's on the inside of the gut can be absorbed and go into the bloodstream. 
And that's the theory. And so has it got any legs? Well, he's looked for evidence of zonulin hypersecretion and the leaky gut in a range of diseases. And these are the diseases that he links to evidence for leaky gut. Type 1 diabetes, he says, is an autoimmune disease to eat with a leaky gut. Now, he's not Tim Noakes in Cape Town, some madman. This is a professor at Harvard Medical School. And he, he's one of the great scientists, and he's got a fabulous talks on, on YouTube. So his two most recent contributions, he's published a book which I ordered, hasn't received or arrived yet, Describing the condition of non-celiac gluten intolerance, in other words, a wide range of conditions which we consider to be minor irritations, like sniffly noses and so on, he believes they're related to gluten intolerance. And that I've had many patients tell me, you know, so the moment I cut gluten, this went away or that went away. And I just routinely tell people to stop eating wheat if they've got any minor condition, doesn't matter what it is. So that's really important. This condition of non-celiac gluten intolerance is widespread. But most importantly, his most recent presentation on the internet, he said the following. Now, anyone who said this has to be insane. All diseases begin and end in the gut. Sorry, begin and end in the gut. Now, this man's insane, or else he's right. And if he's right, this is the most important advance in medicine in 140 years. Because 140 years ago, we discovered bacteria and antibiotics and so on. And that introduced that whole era of medicine. What he's saying is that the gut flora is the determinant of our health. And I don't know if he's right or wrong. But if he's right, this is astonishing. Because it changes completely the way we practice medicine in the future. And I just happen to think he's right. And if he is right, we really have to change the way we practice medicine. The question is, has the promotion of five to 11 servings of cereal grains per day led to an increase in autoimmune and other conditions, and especially this condition, non-celiac gluten intolerance? So many of the patients, when we put them, they say, gee, I've got so much energy. Why is that? I think they just have a chronic inflammation, perhaps from this non-celiac gluten intolerance. But I would just encourage you to consider that condition. Then finally, finally, and it really will take two seconds, taking the message to the world. I think, you know, everything's on our side. We've got the science. We understand the population is insulin resistant, and that's the only thing I can do to survive with insulin resistance, eat this diet. And then there's the problem which, of cereals and grains, which hasn't really been addressed, but which is sitting there as, a, as an elephant in the background. But taking the message to the world, we saw Ignaz Semmelweis's story earlier today. And this is the man who worked out that if, if the obstetrician washed his hands, he wouldn't cause the transfer of infections from the autopsy room to the mothers in labor. Because what was happening, and he was the leader in this, that he was so enthusiastic to find out why were the patients dying from puerperal sepsis or childbed fever, that as soon as the mother died, he would do the autopsy, and then he would go straight back to the ward and deliver the next patient. And he worked out that he was transferring something from the dead mothers to the live mothers, and that he was killing them. And he realized that because he had a stroke of genius. And so what we now know is 82% of all deaths from childbed fever in the hospital he worked in would have been prevented if, if obstetricians had adopted his findings and simply washed their hands. But they didn't. And why didn't they? Because they could not conceive that they were killing their patients. And that's, in a sense, our problem. We can't conceive that what we're doing is wrong or we're not prepared to admit it. So the question is, does the same apply to those promoting the current nutritional guidelines? We can't see the truth for what it is. And that's cognitive dissonance. And we've heard a lot of speakers say there's cognitive dissonance. The evidence is so clear for what we're doing. And so I'm going to finish up with one of my great heroes, Richard Feynman. And he, he writes amazingly because he writes in the slang way, which I wasn't taught how to write that way. You have to clean it up and so on. And he just writes about all his experiences. He's completely transparent. Whatever he, happened to him in his life, he just describes it. But, but this was his final statement, which I hope that we'll take forward as, as, as what's really important, not only for the believers, but for the non-believers. Because he said, the first principle is that you must not fool yourself. And that's why the speakers are here. Because we saw something that wasn't compatible with what we were taught. And we couldn't fool ourselves. And that's what we brought with us, brought 
to this meeting. We people, we weren't prepared to fool ourselves. As Eric said, he just followed the data, or Steve said, he just followed the data. And you are the easiest person to fool because you've got this huge ego and you can't be wrong. So you have to be very careful about that. After you've not you're fooled yourself, it's easy not to fool other scientists. You just have to be honest in a conventional way after that. And I want to hope that you saw some of the most honest scientists you will ever see on this podium speaking to you. And they're honest because they have absolutely no conflicts of interest. And they had to give up careers. They had to potentially give up careers because they were too honest. And that's the message that I want you to take, take with you. That you've heard honest people telling you what they honestly believe. And they prepared to stand up against the world and say, this, it can't go on forever. I don't want to fool myself. I can't fool myself. And then we can appreciate what Feynman said. So thank you very much for your attention.